It was good fortune and good friends that spared my life that terrible April in the year 1812. Dr. Dean extracted the ball from my arm and my shoulder began to look less like a lump of liver. But he reckoned I'd be bedridden for weeks. The doctor spread the story that my mother was seriously ill and that he needed to visit her twice each day. My father left for Macclesfield, telling everyone I was going with him, and it was with sadness and trepidation that I heard the wagon lumbering out of the yard to the accompaniment of the dog's excited barking. Never did my mother enjoy herself so thoroughly as during the three weeks I kept my bed, coming to fuss over me a hundred times a day, dusting the furniture in my room and watching over the kitchen broth and rice pudding that Mary brought me, jealous that she could not cook it herself. If there was a knock at the door, she would skip back to her room, tumble into bed, draw the clothes over and set to groaning as though in mortal agony. Dr. Dean was my mother's great comfort during this enforced confinement. From his twice daily visits, the neighbours drew gloomy conclusions as to mother's desperate state of health. But if they could have seen him sat in an easy chair, profaning the sanctity of the bedroom with tobacco smoke, and relishing our best Hollands while detailing village gossip to my mother's delighted ears, they would have had less concern for the good soul's health. Mrs Garside's been inquiring about you, Mrs Bamford. She says you may be drawing your last breath soon. She freely forgives you any injury you have done her in the past. Trust her to take a mean advantage of me, and me laid on my back and not able to stick up for Miss Hen. Take her a cruet of water, Doctor, and say I'd be glad if she look into it and turn it into vinegar. But you're taking nothing, Doctor. Fill your glass and have another pipe. Never mind the smoke, it's good for moths. And thus did Dr. Dean pass the time in those professional visits, the pretentious length of which gave so much anxiety to our friends. I saw little of Soldier Jack in those early days of my confinement. He had been chary of coming for fear of arousing the suspicion of our neighbours, but was useful in spreading the news of my mother's illness. He had her one day on the brink of death, one day rallying, and had kinfolk strained so far that they began to look up their mourning. At length he could keep away no longer, and came one afternoon to my room, accompanied by my mother and Mary. Poor Jack. He looked sadly worn and harassed, and had lost his swagger and cheerfulness. John Bowes is dead as a nit, Ben. Shot through the leg and had no stamina to bear it. He died that same night. Tell me about it, soldier. Well, he died at, at, at Tommy Sheard's. Was he in much pain? And did he say out? Well, as far as I can gather, after we were carried off, Tudders didn't stay long behind and gave him her up. How did we come to leave Booth? I promised I'd see to him in a pretty way I kept my word. Don't blame yourself, Ben. John brought it on his sen. We were all over the shop egging men on and I told him to keep in cover. But he seemed fair to run again the bullets as if he wanted killing. Well, he got what he wanted. You was it, and Sam Hartley was shot through the lungs and vomiting quarts of blood. John lay nearby among broken glass and plaster in front of Mill. Then Hammond Robertson, the fighting parson, gallops up with a load of soldiers, and Cartwright opens the mill door and comes out. Poor John. They were begging folks to fetch him a drop of water. But old Robertson, damn him, said it, it were confession first and water after. Well, John wouldn't say no, water or no water. And they put him on a gate and they carried him up to the star. A doctor were no long turning up, for them chaps smell blood like vultures. He said they went out for it but to hamper take the leg. 
That were more than John could stand. And he cheated both Parson and Gallows and died like a man. And a Briton he was. How cheat the Parson, Jack? Well, old Robertson wouldn't let him die in peace, but were all time nagging him to confess. Then, when Booth knew his end was near, he called old Robertson over to stand by him and told Sinner's face lit up. You see, gentlemen, the power of the church, he said. Can you keep a secret, sir, said Jack in a whisper. But all were so still you could hear a pin drop. And so can I, said John with a smile. And he put his head back and he never spake no more. He were buried in Huddersfield Churchyard. George Meller and Thorpe walked after the hearse and hundreds of folk were there. Them that could lay their hands on a bit wore white crepe round their arms. It were a grand funeral. And Faith? She looked all broken up, poor wench. I'll go straight to her. Aye, do, Mary, and bring her back to home with you. She wants some kitchen physic as well as other folk. You forgot you're supposed to be ill in bed, Aunt, and Ben away to Macclesfield. Well, if I'm not ill yet, I soon will be if this work goes on longer. Oh, dear. George, that's a deal to answer for. Oh, I'd best be going. I don't want to draw attention to you all here. I'll see thee out, Jack. Well, you keep away from the door. It's a bad job, Faith, losing a brother like that, Mary. Her whole life seemed wrapped up around John. I blame me sen, shocking that I left him to shift for his sen. I promised Faith I'd keep an eye on him. Well, you did your best and can do no more. It's no use working the sen into a fever over it. I should have thought that more feeling in there, Mary. Feeling? I've feeling enough. It's time to talk a bit of sense. Happen that I'll live to envy John Booth and wish that I'd been left for dead at Ralford's instead of enjoying a worse fate. I never hear a step come to the door and my heart goes in my mouth and my knees shake so I can hardly stand. There's feeling for you. Mr Chew says it's a hanging job for them what's caught. I've not told you yet, Mary. I made a promise to John too. You seem to have been precious free with the promises. I promised John, if out happened to him, I'd look after Faith for him. She's not but a poor weak thing, and her father's almost as bad. Don't you think we ought to do something to help her? With all my heart, Ben. But how? You might ask her if she wants a home. We could maybe make a room for her, and you could offer her some work at the spinning or milking. Why, Faith's been brought up a lady. It's no more than me and your mother does every day of our lives. But to be sure, I'm not a lady. Perhaps you'd like to make Faith a present, or allow her a pension. I'm glad things are mending with you. Perhaps thou's come into a fortune and been keeping it a secret for killing us with joy. Quit the teasing, Mary. It's no jesting matter for poor Faith. It were right enough for poor John to speak to you. But what can you do? Thou's an out, and half an out's an out all the world over. I could be a brother to her, Mary. Oh, a brother? I should have thought you had enough a brother to sicken thee for life. Faith needed a loma with a father. The aspect you could set up there every week to play the brother. Then you can take your sisters out on long walks and buy her rings and keepsakes and all that. You'll find it cheaper to buy her a plane and begin with. Well, why not? Faith's a sweet lass and true. Over pale and thin, maybe, for everybody's fancy. But she'll cure her that with plenty of good milk and fresh air. And I think she leans a bit on me, don't you, Mary? Mary doesn't run to such trash. What's she talking to me for? I'm no faith. Ask herself. Well, happen I will. I've a good mind to. I'd waste no time then. Chance somebody snaps her up first. And while you're about it, ask her to come and nurse thee so she'll know what's her for her. It was clear to me that my position was anything but an enviable one. Large rewards had been offered for information about the attack on Rawfold's Mill. A machine breaking had been made a capital offence. My own participation in the affair was known to scores and suspected by hundreds more. A letter from my father drove my mother to distraction by telling of the trial and punishment of the Nottingham Luddites. However, my convalescence was proceeding and I was now able to leave my bed. I turned over in my mind the feasibility of leaving home for a few months till things blew over a bit. I was meditating on the matter and wondering why George Mellon never came near. 
when I heard the sound of horses' hooves in the yard. Oh, Benny's soldiers, and that rogue long Tom's with him. Hello? Be anyone at home? Hello? Be anyone at home? The door's unlocked. Wait here, I'll take a look round. Hello? William Bamford? I'm hearing the King's name. Is anyone upstairs? Hello? What have we here? What do you want? How dare you force your way into decent folks' homes? Well, well, if it ain't the gamesome wench that slapped my face. Aye, and I'll slap it again if you're not off. Don't you know this is a sick house? My mistress is stricken with pox. Gentle, Mary, gentle. The sergeant has doubtless business here. Your errand, sir? If it ain't the youngster what spoilt my beauty for me. Nay, sit still. Bandage too, and in the forearm. If you have business here, I pray you do it. Is your name Ben Bamforth? It is. Then what the devil are you doing here, you thundering young idiot? Why aren't you a thousand miles away? Oh, good soldier. Our Ben's a quiet, harmless lad as ever lived. I'm sure he's done nothing wrong, and him bed fast for six months. Keep your distance, good woman. If it's your one that has the smallpox. As for this lad, he played a mighty heavy fist for a sick man not three months gone. Mother, calm yourself. What is your will with me, sir? I'm very sorry. A man like you ought to be fighting Mount Seer and a proper life guardsman you'd make. However, I see no help for it. I suppose this talk of smallpox is flam. And you, miss, what is this game cock to you? He's my cousin, sir. I'm sure you've a good heart. You must not think ill of Ben for besting you when you fought. It was all done for me. I don't think any the worse of him, pretty. I think all the better of him. It served me right. If I ain't taken a drop too much, I shouldn't have tried to steal a kiss. Though you will admit the provocation. Still, I owe you some return, miss, for my ill manners. Is he old Telston for cousin? He's my sweetheart, sir, and we're to wed when all's well. It will kill me if you take him away. And the lucky dog he is to have such a fair bride. I'll risk it. Bamford, you've had a narrow shave. Be careful of the company you keep. There's a man in your confounded league who has no love of Ben Bamford. Good day, ma'am. I wish you the better of the smallpox. Stay, sir. Miss? I thought you wanted a kiss the other night. Aye, and you refuse me smartly. Well, well, I've changed my mind. <laughs> God, Bamford, lad, I'd change places with you this minute and risk Jack Ketch. Good luck and good day. A false scent again, lads. Let's move on. I made to thank Mary, but she fled from my room and I saw no more of her that day. The next morning, instead of my usual bowl of porridge, she brought a dish of tea and a buttered egg. I could have drawn her to my heart as surely as any lover may draw his mistress. Why, Mary, lass, surely thou'll give me a kiss now. And why now? T'was only yesterday you told Long Tom that you and me were engaged to be wed. That one out. I said it to help thee. Sup the tea before it gets cold, and if there's then such an hurry to get wed, remember he has more than half promised to Faith Booth. Justice Radcliffe was soon hot on the trail of the Luddites. Patrols were more active than ever, and the Luds had an uneasy feeling that there was a telltale in their midst. My strength was returning, and I was able to get about a bit. It was on a stroll through Mills Bridge that I came across Mr. Radcliffe himself on horseback and riding towards me. Ben Barnforth, if I'm not mistaken. At your service, sir. Your father is good, Mr. Barnforth, the clothier. The same, sir. A worthy man is your father, Master Barnforth, and a loyal subject of his majesty. You have been sick of late, they say. Now to speak on. I'm all right now. Still, you must be careful. Who's your doctor? Dr. Dean. What? My good friend, Dr. Dean? The sly dog. Still, a patient's a patient. Has Dr. Dean said nothing to you about avoiding the night air for a time? Not that I recall, Your Worship. Well... Tell him that you've seen me, and my advice is that you keep indoors these spring nights. It is unnecessary, sir. I am entirely of that opinion myself. That's good hearing. Mind you stick to it, and thank 